People who work for airlines, what are secrets passengers don't know? When flying overseas there are generally no systems tracking the movement of your aircraft for several thousand miles that is, how they go missing. People fake needing a wheelchair to gain boarding priority. 10 wheelchairs get on and only one person needs it getting off. We call them miracle flights. If you checked your dog there's about a 30% chance it's terrified before it even gets on the plane. Who knows how scared it gets during the actual flight. Bag room agents will usually try to comfort a scared animal, but all we can really do is talk to it, so if you write your pet's name on their carrier it usually helps a lot. I've never seen a cat who was scared in the bag room. Cats don't give a frick. That there's a huge list of things that can be missing from the aircraft while still being allowed to fly. True. It's called a minimum equipment list, Mel. Counterintuitively, it's a list of what can be broken on the aircraft while it still remains airworthy. It should be noted that the operational limits of the aircraft are altered to respond to broken parts. For instance, if certain lights are broken, the aircraft is restricted to daytime use. You know how all the other armrests can be raised except for the one next to the aisle? Turns out that one can be raised as well via a small button and a divot on the underside of the armrest. Useful if you want to spread out a bit more, though some flight attendants may tell you to put it back in place. If you check a skateboard by just slapping a sticker on it, it will get ridden or used as a dolly. Might check my skateboard just to entertain the baggage dudes. Paramedic here. If you switch on your alarm lights on the ambulance while being on the inner field of the airport, because, well you just get there sometimes, they will totally shut down all incoming and outgoing flights until they know exactly what's going on. My buddy learned this the hard way. Needless to say people got mad at him. I'm an outstation mechanic for multiple airlines. I cover all flights at a major US city airport, by myself. Where to start? If your flight has a maintenance delay and there is no on-station mechanics for that carrier I get called. If it's a quick fix, I fix it. If not we check to see if it can be deferred to get fixed later. Either way, most of your delay is spent waiting on me to do all the paperwork to clear the aircraft or for me to finish the other 7 calls I'm out on to get to your plane. There is also constant pressure on both me and the pilots to clear fly aircraft that have some fairly significant problems. I have airlines try to get me to sell some pretty sketchy stuff to the pilots to get them to fly and avoid a costly delay. I have no problems telling a pilot to call his controller's dispatchers and tell them to frick off if I'm not comfortable with whatever concoction of deferral action I was asked to perform. Don't get me wrong, the airlines would never willingly fly an unsafe aircraft. But if there is say an engine vibration that is just right at a sea hair under the limit they will fly it. If the oil is super low but servicing it will cause a delay, service it at the next stop. If the pilot encounters something at altitude that I can't duplicate on the ground, sign it off and see if it happens again. Those are the ones I usually push back on depending what it is. Also, if you have to get out of your seat so a mechanic can fix something don't be about it. I get harassed all the time by passengers even though my sole purpose is to get them in the air. Besides, I tell gate agents all the time not to load packs until I get out there but they never listen so go be at them. Not a secret, just common sense. The reason some bags miss their flight or get misrouted is because passengers don't remove old tags. It confuses handlers as well as the conveyor belt scanners. I see it happen all the time. I used to work for warehouse that supplied a certain airline with items. The headsets that are given to you are not new. Despite being wrapped up, they are taken off the flight, cleaned, and then packaged again. Flight attendants have a list of who is who and what seat they are in, as well as what level of frequent flyer they happen to be, or if they are employees or family and friends tickets. This is why you will see them being rude to someone or bending over backwards for jerks. Flights are routinely overbooked because there's an estimate per route of what percentage of people tend to miss the flight, so if you don't have a seat assignment, you might not get on, which is why they ask for volunteers. If you are a frequent flyer and know the busy times and flights you could volunteer all day from every flight going to a hub and make $1000 in credit. Invest in quality luggage. You are the only one that handles your bag with care. Your bag is going to take a beating in the system. 
employees and their families get id tickets it is for industry discount, which means they only pay taxes and fees and nothing for the actual ticket. The airlines basically lets them fly for free, and not just with their own airline, but with every airline in any alliance. The tickets are standby tickets, so you're not guaranteed to get on board, but you get a seat more often than not. The family members can travel on these tickets without the employee. My dad worked for an airline in Star Alliance, so I used to get free tickets with airlines in One World and Sky Team as well as Star Alliance. I usually traveled in business class, all around the world. A return trip between Europe and Japan was something like 200 US dollars in business class, and maybe 50 US dollars in economy. I don't get any perks anymore, as it was only valid until I turned 25. Sometimes your pilot can be on food stamps because they only make 19k Baggage handlers see hundreds of bags a day. No bag is treated special, unless it is obvious. Even then, depending on the person, sometimes they're not, which is rare. Bags are not intentionally harmed. They are, however, intentionally thrown, slid, jostled, stacked under hundreds of pounds of other bags and exposed to the elements because that is the nature of the job. You can safely assume that your bag is touched and handled by at least 7-8 people per flight segment. If you are connecting at least 10 different people, not including TSA, sometimes the vehicle that fills the potable water for washing hands and making coffee is parked next to the vehicle that is used to dump the shitters and fill the blue juice for the labs. They're not supposed to. Sometimes, they're parked at a distance from each other, which is policy, yet the guy who is filling the water is using gloves that he hasn't changed in over 2 years. The most power you could probably wield is Twitter. The employee in front of you has so little power to actually remedy tough situations. Baggage handlers are usually short-staffed, as well. Customer service agents are usually limited in their options. Also, it would help us get a message to higher ups because our work is not being supported as it should be. Heck, I'd even recommend asking an employee about the problem and say something like, if I were to take my complaint to Twitter, how could I phrase it in a way that would help you too? You get more customer protections buying directly from the airline. All those third party travel sites are owned by the same company, and you'll lose a lot of the right afforded to you in the airline's contract of carriage. If you're nice to people, they'll be nice back to you. When the drink card is coming through, you can ask for a full can of pop instead of the tiny little cup filled with mostly ice. Not particularly a secret but one time I was upgraded to business class on a plane that was delayed for maintenance. Just settling into my middle row I'll seat up at the movie screen bulkhead when a hatch in the floor of the cabin right at my feet flipped open and the maintenance engineer climbed up. He had a clipboard of paperwork for the pilot to sign, then climbed back into his hole, tipping his hat to the passengers before closing the hatch over his head. If you look for it you can see a recessed pull ring in the cabin floor in front of the first row seats behind cockpit. I work revenue management for an airline. On average, the cheapest time to buy a ticket is Tuesday afternoon. The cheapest time to fly is Tuesday, Wednesday, or Saturday. This applies to US flights in my experience. Aerospace fastener production here. Nobody there asks what is actually holding the plane together. Don't worry about it. The coffee is absolutely disgusting because no one washes the container that goes out every morning. The station agents who get paid way too little don't give a crap about cleaning it. I certainly didn't when I worked for AA. Also, because we weren't given the proper supplies to clean it, we pretty much just rinsed it out and dumped coffee into it. Be nice to the ticket agent and they will pretty much always let you get away with overweight bags. If you were funny, I'd even not charge you for bags. My partner worked for Delta for about 4 years as one of the guys who loads and unloads your luggage and waves wands. Nothing is safe in those bags. They pop open all the time and your crap just gets haphazardly shoved back in. They get tossed around like volleyballs. Tsa is a lie. A lot of decisions about boarding or switching flights, act, are at employee's discretion. Worked on military aircraft but it's something I've noticed pretty universal about jet engines in general. You have your auxiliary engine that runs while the aircraft is parked, providing power, hydraulics, AC, ETC while you're at the terminal. When getting ready to depart, you turn on your main engines. It takes a lot of power to get them started. 
As such, most of the auxiliary power goes to starting the engines. This is the point where usually you may see the lights flicker, and you will hear the whine of the main engine start up. The environmental control unit, or whatever they want to call it, stops cycling air during this start sequence. Without fail, if you watch for it, numerous hands will stick up and check or adjust the air conditioning vents as this happens. The air will kick back on when the engines are up and running. As shown in some movies like Executive Decision and Passenger 57, there is a secret hatch on every plane that allows people to travel freely throughout the aircraft. Also, Wade Boggs once drank 50 beers on a cross-country flight and then absolutely destroyed the Seattle Mariners the next day. Worked at multiple airports as a consultant and this is common at almost all I've worked at. Mechanics love to take their coffee breaks right behind the security checkpoint. This is where you will see women in a rush with their outermost garments off and bending over to put their shoes back on. The jackpots are passengers that didn't know a sweater or hoodie they are wearing had to come off until they are told to remove it by that sar. So they have very little underneath. I wasn't part of this so don't downvote me. Just telling the tales of the trade. Not an airport. I worked at a theme park in Florida. There was a water ride where ladies would often get their blouses splashed with water. There was a bridge over a part of the ride where you could look straight down as the riders went by. It was a very popular place for male employees to stop and look over the rail of the bridge for a few minutes. You have been visited by the Bepis Doggo of good old times comment drink well doggo to get infinite Bepis. If you are new to the channel, you can subscribe. I publish new videos every day. Until then, check another video. Or don't. Either way, have a great day you magnificent people.